The Catholics of Oz is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 19 of The Catholics of Oz. The Catholics of Oz is a show where we discuss faith, culture, and what's been happening from an Aussie perspective. Whether it's synods or sides, apostolates and apps, providence or productivity, you can hear it right now on The Catholics of Oz. Hello, welcome to episode 19 of The Catholics of Oz. My name is Lindsay Sants, your host, and I'm joined today by Jared Trapnell. Jerry, how are you? G'day, Lindsay. Good to be here. Good, good. So it seems like we've been doing a bit of a swap. It's been you or Caroline. We've all been all uh, had different things going on at different times. You've been you've been the constant. Yeah, fortunately, because I live at the place <laughs> where we podcast usually, so that helps. Yeah, uh, Caroline's a little bit under the weather and very busy at the moment, but um, we are hoping to get the band back together and have a have a trio. In fact, the last time we had a trio was when we recorded on Let's Talk with Father Corey. Shameless plug. <laughs> so anyway, we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. But anyway, um, before we do start, we'd like to remind everyone that you can like episodes of The Catholics of Oz on the SQPN Facebook page. You can also retweet our episodes on Twitter and leave us comments as well. Thank you for the people who have left comments and have been liking our episodes. We do notice and it does give us a little bit of a buzz when, uh, when people do that. So we'd love if more and more people did it as well. Don't forget, you can also subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or your favorite podcast app. We're also on YouTube. If you go to the SQPN uh, YouTube page and you can subscribe there, just hit the bell to get notifications when new episodes of The Catholics of Oz and other SQPN shows come out. You can also leave us feedback on iTunes and other podcast directories, and that helps to share the podcast and get us noticed. And don't forget to tell your friends and other people in your communities so that we can reach more listeners. So, Jerry, why don't we start with something personal? I bet you don't know anything about me. You were born in Phoenix. You went to school in Tempe. You're an only child. Your favorite show is something called The Real Housewives of Atlanta. And your favorite book is Kendall Jenner's Instagram feed. How did you know all that? So, Jerry, this is a topic that uh, you've been (laughs) angling for a while now. We've been waiting for the right time to fit this in. Um, and what we wanted to do uh, was to start a bit of a discussion about how we're raising our kids uh, to be Catholic. So we've got kids of different age ranges, and we'll get into that a bit later on. But we wanted to talk about some of the things that we do that I guess we think works, you know, just in our struggles to be parents and to try and be good parents. Um, but hopefully with this discussion, we'll also hear from you, our listeners, about things that you do because maybe you probably have better ideas than we do and, we, um, and a lot more experience, so that would be great. So we might go back and forth and, you know, just do one, one each, you know, until we get through our, our, list, our lists. Um, so, Jerry, I'm going to throw it over to you. Uh, which child or is it both children and, and what do you do that works? All right, well, primarily it's probably going to be about Caitlin because she's seven, James is, you know, four, not even at, at uh, schooling of any kind yet. So uh, he gets a bit more of a, a longer leash to run with, I suppose. Um, and most of the things we do with him in Catholic events are more about keeping him quiet and not disturbing everyone else rather <laughs> than true. totally getting um, involved. Um, I suppose in fact, can I interrupt yes. you? Speaking about James being loud at Catholic events, do you remember that time when uh, it was near the end of Mass and uh, and he was talking a bit loudly and, your, and he was giving your wife Priscilla a bit of trouble and uh, and she said, don't you know, don't make too much noise, don't don't talk so loudly. And then he goes, no, mum, I want to talk loud. And he shouted at the top of his lungs in church. And your wife was embarrassed, unfortunately, for Priscilla. Yes, he has a bit of a habit for being quiet most times until he says something he wants to say, which, you know, we've, 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 we've talked about before in, um, in personal times um, together. Yes. Um, we had dinner. Uh, Lindsay and I had family dinner on Friday night with, um, with our wives' family. And yeah, a lot of the talk we were talking about was centered on James's inappropriate outbursts. <laughs> um, talking, we're getting a bit off topic here. Um, talking, right. talking about, uh, a teacher was talking about fishing at the beach and James pipes up and says, why go to the beach? We can just get fish from the shops. <laughs> yes. That sounds just like him. <laughs> um, so yes. Go so, for it, so, Jerry. So part of, um, part of dealing with James is keeping him from inappropriate and noisy outbursts. Um, I suppose my, uh, Catholic, uh, you know, try, trying to help raise my kids Catholic. I've sort of split my uh, options between going, you know, things at mass and things outside mass. Sure, because um, that's primarily where they get their uh, their, their Catholic faith is a, a big part of it. Is the the you know the weekend mass where we all go to. Um, probably one of my favourite parts of getting them involved of, of of the mass is with them is getting them involved in the collection. 
Right. So you might have noticed that, you know, we wander in at whatever time, the choir's already sitting there, and one of the senior members of the choir will end up, you know, just sort of poking the collection plate at me because I don't feel like doing it. Oh, we know who you're talking about. We won't out him right here, but we know who you're talking Not about. Not right here and right now, yeah. but yes, yeah. <laughs> he, he ends up with, the, with the, uh, you know, the collection plate and he'll just poke it in our general direction. I've either got to catch it or stop it, you know, hitting me in the guts. Cause he's, <laughs> he's that kind of guy. He's that kind of guy, yeah. <laughs> um, and so rather than just wandering out myself and doing it like pretty much everyone else sort of does, I'll take the kids with me. Um, so we wander up to the front, we do the genuflection, they sort of stumble through that and I try and make sure they don't fall over while they're, <laughs> while they're doing it. And then they, I sort of, as long as they don't get out of hand or control and um, mess it up or do anything silly, I sort of let them do the collection and pass the, you know, pass the plate along to, 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 you know, the parishioners on the rows. And I feel like that, as well as being, um, a benefit for the kids to, they're actually doing something, getting on their feet, because let's face it, kids aren't all that keen on the sit stand and, and don't move. Um, gets, I'm not sure why. <laughs> <laughs> as well as getting them on their feet, they see what we, you know, a part, they get involved in a part of what we're doing. Hopefully, that'll extend to more things later on, which I'm sure you'll go into later on. Yep. Um, with your with your child, with your son, um, as well as getting them involved, it also gets, you know, it, I think it warms the hearts and brings a smile to the people who see. And like they, you know, I don't get many smiles when I do the collection. Funnily enough. Um, but when you know, Caitlin and James are sort of taking the collection, sort of swaying and you know trying to walk together, they're not good at uh, walking together too well. Um, <laughs> but but um, you get a lot more smiles and engagement from the people who are you know it's, it's part of it is just you know it's part of the mass where you put money, your donation, your weekly donation into the plate, let's say. But it's also they see a younger child getting involved in mass, and I think I feel like across the board, seeing someone young involved in mass, you know. It, to try and, I'm trying not to use the words, but I can't think of anything else. It warms the heart. Yeah. I couldn't think of anything else that sounded less uh, cliche, but yes, it does. Yeah. It's, yeah, it does. It warms the heart. And then, um, then they'll, they'll take it to the back and, you know, one of the, you know, the senior, because they don't get involved in taking it up to the altar, but then they'll, they'll pass it along to one of the other members of the parish who usually has something nice to say with them or you know, poke them on the nose or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And, if, and that's probably the best way that they can get involved at the moment. I wouldn't trust them with the offertory. Or much else, really? Probably not. <laughs> not. Not at this stage. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. Yeah, he's getting he's getting a foothold, and you probably have to sort of. You, you, for, I suppose for the listener, it might be that you have to sort of initiate it yourself because um, I was you know we're kind of lucky that we've got someone who pokes the pokes the plate at me to make me do it. <laughs> um, but in a way of just getting your kids involved, whatever their age is, in a way that they're somehow involved in the procession, um, not the procession at the um, proceedings of mass. Yeah, that's great. It, it's um, building community and we talk about being the body of Christ and um, having your kids involved in service, I think, is a beautiful thing. Um, so I'll, uh, my, my first tip, and I will talk about service at Mass a little bit later on, but uh, I'm going to start with um, the beginning of our children's lives. And this one, this is a personal choice. There's, this isn't a rule. Anyone can, you know, people can, for whatever reason, um, people choose different kids' names. So, is, uh, you know, Isabel and I talked about this and what we thought was we wanted to name our children after role models with stories. And the whole idea is that I guess if, a, if your child throughout their whole life knows the origin of their name, like why the parents chose it for them, um, then, it, you know, then there's, it's hopefully a story that they'll maybe try to emulate or at least be inspired by as well. So my son, Damien, my oldest son, who's 10 years old, uh, we named him after St. Damien of Molokai. Um, and, uh, it was very, it was very hard to pick a name. Like we picked a boy's and a girl's name cause we didn't know what he was going to be obviously. Um, and we agonized over what name it was going to be. And I had thought about, uh, Damien for a long time. And I remember tell, I actually remembered months and months before Alex, uh, sorry, Alexander, before <laughs> Damien, let's get my kids mixed up before Damien was born telling you about it, you know, back in the, the good old 2008. And I actually remember that it was, uh, we were getting closer to the date when Damien would be born. And uh, I think I'd kind of forgotten about the name Damien. I, I don't know, maybe the pressure got to me or something or, you know, just male memory. Is, uh, you know, I've been accused of having that too. Um, and I remember you and I were just having a walk along the beach when mm -hmm. we were there with our friends. And, uh, and you were saying, you know, oh, so have you thought of any, you know, thought of any names? And I was like, oh, I'm not really. Yeah, we're, we've been umming and ahhing. And then you said, oh, what about Damien? Remember you talked about that? I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. And that actually kind of solidified it, that discussion I had with you. But um, the reason why, Saint, why Damien um, is because uh, I actually love St. Damien's story. Uh, this was a, a priest who um, 
who went to the island of Molokai and went to a leper colony there. Um, he was very fresh. He was, uh, he was a religious brother who was sent in his own brother's place, his, like, who was a priest um, who got too sick to go to the missions um, in Molokai. Um, and he ended up uh, going there himself, inexperienced. He was ordained when he arrived in Hawaii and, and uh, had a couple of adventures trying to evangelize, which didn't go very well in Hawaii itself. He had a sort of a mixed uh, range of success, but he ended up being one of the, the first volunteers to go to, to Molokai to a part of this island where lepers were sent. It was the policy of the, of the government at the time um, to send lepers to a colony so, no, so the, the, the disease wouldn't spread. Um, so it was meant to be a three-month stint, and he ended up spending the rest of his life there until he died from leprosy himself. Um, the reason why I like him as a role model is because he was a flawed human being who tried everything to hang on to, to develop holiness. Uh, he was stubborn. Um, and there's no lying about that. He was a very naughty boy when he was young. And in fact, uh, Damien used to like me telling him those stories. There was a, there was a story about how, um, him and his friends used to throw rocks at horses from horse and carriage that would, that would drive by, uh, because it would get the horse excited and try, you know, they'll try to make the horse bolt. And at one stage, uh, he had, a, or the other thing they would try and do is jump onto the back of carriages as well. And in fact, uh, in a biography I read of him, he managed to do that and then fell off. And then the wheel of the carriage rolled over his head. And the reason why he didn't die, apparently, this is what they were saying is the possible case, is because the mud was so soft that it just pushed his head into the ground and he managed to survive. Um, what, when his brother had written a book about him, the, uh, the book... Uh, presented him as holy, holy, you know, tried to make him like Jesus. There's a story about how he, um, how his parents uh, had, uh, were looking for him and uh, they found him in a church. And, they were, you know, his brother was trying to liken it to Jesus being lost. You know, they lost him for a couple of days and found him in the temple. The reality behind that story is that um, Damien had been a very naughty young child and he ran into the church because he knew his parents couldn't tell him off while he was in the church. So apparently they were standing at the door going, get out here, get out here now, you're in trouble. And he was standing in the church going, I'll only come out if you don't promise not to yell at me. So, uh, you know, great stories for kids to tell. But also the fact that um, he was a person who, uh, who showed Christ's compassion for, for people who were sick, that people had given up on and didn't care about anymore. The leper colony itself, they were sent there with no resources or they were given resources but they were too sick to do anything with them they couldn't build themselves and do a lot of work um and so through his stubbornness he had forced for example people who who delivered supplies on merchant ships to build water piping and things like that so they could have running water uh, and help build buildings and things like that so he was uh loved by some people and not liked a lot by including some of his religious superiors because uh that stubbornness that he had is i think what got a lot of things done um and he helped to raise um, the dignity of these people. The last thing I'll say about him, sorry. I'm... <laughs> we, we might be switching or preempting yeah. topics here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the last thing I'll say about him is um, that basically he, um, it, on his deathbed, so he ends up contracting leprosy. Obviously, being around people um, with leprosy would probably eventually do that in his prolonged exposure. Um, but on his deathbed, uh, he, when he found out that there'd be other priests and nuns to take over his ministry, and I'm going through his biography here, uh, he prayed what's called the, the Nunc Dimittis, which is the prayer that we pray in the divine office before we go to sleep. And it's the prayer of Simeon who saw Jesus as an infant, the, the prophet Simeon. And he said, you know, now my eyes have seen the Lord. Now, Lord, you can let your servant, your servant go in peace. And he, and he was basically, it was his prayer saying, now I realize God that you can release me from my ministry and, and you can release me into death and into life with you because this ministry will now continue without me. So I think there's a lot of inspiring things about that. Um, as a footnote, Damien's middle name is Benedict, Pope Benedict XVI. Damien was three months uh, in Isabel, you know, like uh, developed three months in, in Isabel's womb at that time when we were at World Youth Day in 2008 when Benedict was there. So I thought that was amazing. Um, and Alexander, very quickly, I won't go into the whole story here, but Alexander is named after my uncle, um, who is my mother's brother, who's a missionary priest in Peru, um, who's, who is also an amazing and inspiring individual as well. So all of those, I think it's great to be able to tell your kids those stories. So, uh, so far with two kids, we've managed to find names. God help us if there's a third. <laughs> Jerry, over to you. Um, all right. Uh, you've, you've taken obviously a bit further away from you know, <laughs> that, um, that I was sort of expecting. That's okay. 
Um, mainly because, uh, well, we, we, okay, spoiler alert, we might be talking about St. Damien of Molokai a little later. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we might have preempted half of his, uh, half of what we're going to talk about with that. that that's sure. fine. I, in fact, I think it's better to leave it in this topic. Yeah, sure. Yeah, cool. cool. <laughs> yeah, that gets it off my chest. <laughs> I'll say, yeah. Well, it's two days after the 10th anniversary. Yeah, of recording, yeah. It's, uh, it's yeah, the 10th or 11th. It'd be, no, it'd be the 10th. You're right. 10th anniversary of his canonization which was on the 11th of October. Which, now, now I'm sort of thinking out of the, out of the blue here, does that yeah. mean he wasn't yet a saint when Damien was born? Uh, like he was obviously on the he way. He was on his yeah, way, yes. So definitely when, on his way. Yeah, when, when Damien was born in January, uh, he was yet to be canonized in October that year, yes. So, uh, you preempted him. <laughs> yeah, so knew it was coming, yeah, just to preempt that, yeah. yeah. You named him after a blessed. Yeah, it was clearly a blessing <laughs> whatever else, yeah. And even if he'd never been canonized... Uh, it was only a matter his, of time, really, yeah. I think, for him. Yeah. But that's... His story was amazing enough, yeah. Um, going on coincidences or guidances, whatever you want to call it. So Damien, uh, his canonization happens happens to be on the same day as my wife's birthday. Yes. yes. So that's pretty good. Uh, he was born on January 3rd, which was the date that my son Damien was meant to be born, but he was born January 4th, so they're pretty close there. It uh, would have been January 3rd in Belgium. There you go. Reckon? Perfect. All right. cool. We'll go I with that. Because of yeah. how far ahead we are. So yeah. like when we recorded with Father Corey, it was a yeah. Saturday for him, but a Sunday for us. Oh, I'll go with that. So my son was born on, on the same day, <laughs> just a, a little bit further ahead. Uh, and he was, the other thing is he was, uh, his feast day is in May, which has no family connection to us at all. But I'm, I'm born in May. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, there you go. That's it. Yeah, his uncle. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> all right. So what's your, uh, what's your next tip, Jerry, for raising kids Catholic? All right. So again, sticking with the mass side of things, um, James is probably a bit young for this. But what I try and do after communion with Caitlin is get her into the habit and getting used to being on her knees and pray and thinking of who and what to pray for sure. um, after communion. Because that was always, I suppose, drilled into our head when we were growing up. Is That's when you, you kneel down and you pray. And that usually meant, um, at school, that usually meant be quiet. Yes, that's right. <laughs> be quiet until, the, until everyone's finished having communion. That's it, yeah. <laughs> but, and so rather than um, get her used to just telling her to be quiet, um, after communion, once we're back, in our seats, uh, or you know, back kneeling down, I'll, I'll sort of pull her next to me and sort of say, so who do we want to pray for today? Um, and, and it also, what I think that does is helps her encar- it helps encourage her to think about things or people, mainly people, that need praying for. So um, I don't know if you knew already, but Alex got a lot of prayers when he was um, when yes. he was younger. He doesn't get so many now because he's probably because he's noisy and walks around and <laughs> yeah, and, he, and destructive and yeah, <laughs> and he's not so help, helpless and hopeless as he was before. So yeah. he got a lot of prayers. She she likes praying for the younger youngest. That's beautiful. Young, yeah, um, which she which she you know she, she she sort of does now. And she also prays, and I like how she does this. She also prays for my great no my grandparents, her great grandparents who are Lovely. pushing ninety, and so you know praying that they they stay they stay and remain healthy and happy. Yeah. Um. So it's really, what I think it does is helps her to think. So I'll try not to prompt her who to pray for. Sometimes I'll have to because she's either tired or just not in the mood for it because yeah. you don't get the same child at church every week. They they have their moods, yes. um, their hunger or their boredom or whatever else. And so um, sometimes I have to be a bit more prompting of who to pray for, or who might who might be a good idea. But um, I mean, even today, we're, we're recording on a Sunday. She came up with everything herself. Um, and it really, I think, helps her focus on what that time of the Mass is used for because there's an hour of Mass and it's broken down into different parts and she's not going to know or do it all at once. She's made no sacraments. She's only seven. Yeah. But at least it's getting her used to this specific part of the Mass. This is what we do at that time of the Mass. And yeah. it's something that I can control because there's no priest or lector talking or anything else happening that she needs to pay attention to. She doesn't need to watch all the people getting communion and that means nothing to her, even though yeah. she might might be a curiosity. Oh, look how they do it. Yeah. Oh, this person didn't do it properly. Oh, <laughs> oh this person's taking it back. Oh, you can, you can, you, if you see Hang someone doing yeah, that, wait you, a you minute. raise your voice. <laughs> yeah. But it, it also gets her to focus um, on people who are less fortunate than us or less yes. able to be, um, you know, who, who need prayers. Yeah. So that's uh, that's that's another bit part in mass that I um that I sort of take with them uh, rather than just you know shutting my eyes and hoping they'll be quiet while I do my own prayers. Yeah. Um, he's getting getting her involved in that way. Um, James wouldn't bother. He he's he's in the keep quiet basket. Yeah, he's in the keep quiet <laughs> basket. Yeah, just just uh, control him for as much as you can for now. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's a, a nice bit of generosity as well from our kids, and I like that because you know, like you say, it it gives them something meaningful to do while the adults are doing what they usually do during communion um, and, and things like that. Um, 
uh, mine's an extension of yours. My next one. Um, sorry. I've got here. No, it's all right. No, no, it's perfect. It's complimentary. Oh. Um, I've got here. Pray with your children at home the way that you pray at mass. So, uh, this is about familiarization with what happens in our in our church communities. So. Uh, for example, with Damien at one stage, because uh, we sing the Our Father at Mass, uh, you know, that, that's gone on for a, a little while. So when I would take him to bed and pray, because we pray, for, that's probably another tip there, pray with your kids before they go to sleep. Um, we would sing the Our Father together. Uh, you wouldn't want to hear how terrible it sounds. <laughs> but the point is, uh, the thing is, I've taken something out of what we do at Sunday Mass and brought it into our home. And I think that builds familiarity um, and in a good way too, not just, oh, well, here's what we do, here's what we do, but to say that this is, uh, that, that, that what you do at Mass continues in your, in your life. Mass is not just contained to the space of an hour and then you forget about it until the next Sunday. Uh, the idea is that the Mass continues in your home and I think that's a, a, a beautiful thing to do. And sometimes it will be, you know, um, other common prayers that we'll say at Mass or um, or if something comes up, if there's a song that's sung a lot at mass or whatever it is, um, or even um, sometimes at my, you know, he will, because of this deepening that I'm attempting to do, he's, he started to remember more about what, um, what, you know, Father Michael says, both Father Michaels, because we've got that crisscross going, um, what they say at their, um, in their homilies, and he'll ask questions about it. And it's just a chance to to talk about Bible readings and things like that. But if you can bring what happens in the mass into your home to show how the mass continues, I think that's a good evangelization technique for your kids too. Your turn, Jerry. Yeah, like that. That's a good one. I like that one. You can steal that one <laughs> before I trademark it. All right. Uh, this one's probably a little more, not left field, but a little less focus on specific sacraments or occasions or anything like that. Yep. One of the things I'll try and get the kids, and it's worked a lot, very well with Caden, and a little less so with James. Yep is to get them to appreciate nature. Yes. So, uh, you know, the story of Adam and Eve and creation, um, we're put on this earth to you know, look after the, the creatures. Yes. Uh, great and small. Yeah. Um, even mosquitoes. Well, uh, um, there might be some exceptions. Maybe even spiders. I'm sure the Bible <laughs> says something about them. <laughs> I just haven't found it yet. I'm looking. <laughs> might have to write our own book. Yes. <laughs> get the spiders, get the mosquitoes. Um. Isn't there a flood to deal with them or something? <laughs> yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, so uh, as, as I said, it's come easily, you know, quite easily with Caitlin, but it's really a matter of, um, of fostering in them. And that's, um, yeah, so I'll keep going. Fostering in them the beauty of um, nature and natural things, things that were not, are not man-made, but things that, are create, things that have been created yeah. and grow of their own accord. So... Animals and you know, small creatures are one thing as well as you know, beauty in plants and, and fauna as well. Um, it's one of the uh, things when I was growing up that made me think there's something more out there. And I think that's what a lot of, when a lot of younger people say, I think there's something out there, you see you know, the beauty and splendor of the natural earth. Mm. And it's so hard to think that there's no guiding thought behind that. Yeah. You know, a big explosion caused you know, oceans, craters, mountains, forests, temperate zones etc you know what there was no thought and design behind that I, it, I just can't get past that yes yeah um, and that was for me a beginning of the formation of my own faith was that okay this hasn't happened by accident it has to be by design because it's so intricate you look at a leaf just a leaf and see all the um you know the intricate lines and grow and and trails that are on there and so at least and i don't know if this is going to work or not but at least in them if i can foster in them some appreciation for the land we live on, not in a you know a crazy greeny type of way or anything <laughs> um, that uh, that that gets a bit of attention these days, but in a yeah. common sense sort of way mm. that it's something to appreciate. It's a it's a gift and it's a blessing. It's not something we have a right to. I'm sort of harkening back to our uh, homily today the, of things we don't that we take for granted that we think we have a right to, which are actually blessings. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But being able to hold, you know, even something like a small lizard or a, or a creature in your hand is a blessing. Yeah. And getting them to appreciate nature in that respect. Yep. Um, I don't know if it's going to lead them, you know, to realize and question that um, the earth we're on is not an accident. I mean, yeah. sorry, yeah, I've got that right. It's yep, not yep. an accident. <laughs> um, that there is something deeper behind it. And in some way it might, you know, lead them onto the path to, to seek things themselves. Yeah, I think, um, I think exposure to nature is evangelizing um 
from you know like you said from seeing how intricately the ecosystem works how intricate uh, our earth is and how finely tuned and balanced it is in, in the setup of it uh, and like you said to lead us to the thoughts of this this can't be a coincidence there's you know, there's surely there's a a creator behind this um because so many ridiculously co- coincidental things would have had to happen for us to exist you know, on a micro scale, but also on a larger scale, looking at our solar system, which I won't go into. That's a Caroline thing now. <laughs> I'm stealing her thunder. But um, yeah, I, I think that's a beautiful thing. But also um, appreciation of nature is also appreciation of the creator of that nature. It's very St. Francis of Assisi in a way too. So, so there you go. You got yeah. some, yeah. Well, I, sp- I suppose it's more coming to terms with the fact that there is a creator of nature. Yeah. And that's what I want them to sort of understand, that it's not just here by, by you know, for no reason at all. Yeah. Um, so it's one thing to get used to nature and like nature, but it's another thing. It's it's an extra step, and that's the step I'm hoping to uh, in engender in them yep. is to appreciate that that nature was made. Yeah. For, um, not for them, but well, yeah, actually, I'm going to recant that. It, yep. is, it is made for them. It's because it was made for all of us. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's a beautiful it one. Is. It's a little yeah. bit more left field. Yeah. Than um than, than the straightforward ones yeah. we've talked about before, but yeah. Certainly complementary to the ones we just said, yes. we talked about before. Um, all right. So my next one is about letting your kids see the good that you do when you are acting out the gospel um, and even involving them if it's, a, if it's safe to do so. And what I mean by that, I'll, I'll give some context to that. Uh, every now and then, and I don't want people to think I'm a wonderful person, but every so often I, I need to go into the city to do something related to whatever. Um, and uh, one thing I've noticed a lot, and in fact, I talked about our um, our school homelessness retreat in uh, in the city in an earlier episode. I can't remember which one it was. Just listen to all of our episodes. You'll come across it at one point. Let us know which one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was uh, noticing homelessness uh, in Melbourne. It's like it's a, it's a, you know, it's, I feel like it's getting worse just anecdotally. Like when I go, I see more instances of people on the streets. Um, and so... Uh, when I'm on my own or when I'm in the city, this, this last time happens to be with my family. Um, I, I like to, um, maybe go up to homeless people, um, and have a chat with them. Just, you know, it's, you know, a bit of dignity. I do, you know, slip some money as well, but I don't want the money to be the point of the meeting, if that makes sense. So, you know, I, I do give some money. So I hope this helps with your needs as well, but, uh, I actually just want to have a conversation for five or 10 minutes and just, you know, just see how they're going and, um, and just have a, uh, non agendary discussion, <laughs> you know, things like that. Just, just to chat like I would chat with you, um, you know, like talking to a friend or, or family. Um, so the last time this happened was on the last Christmas holidays, apart from the city retreat, but the, in terms of family and kids and whatever, it was last Christmas, uh, holidays where we had our six week holiday block from school. Um, and I took my family into the city for some reason and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> Um, but we, again, I noticed, uh, you know, people and there was a, uh, there was a man sitting just down the road on Lonsdale street from, um, from St. Francis church, which we always visit. Um, it's the, one of the oldest churches in Melbourne, used to be the original cathedral, get into the history one day. (laughs) Um, uh, but he was, he was there and, um, we had, uh, you know, Isabel, my wife and Alexander was just a little bub, you know, and I said to I said to them all, I said, "Do you guys mind? You know, just go hang around somewhere. I'm just going to go chat with that guy for a while." I didn't want to bring my family because you know I thought I didn't want to. Not that I'm putting them at risk. I, I don't. How do I put it? I, I wanted to make first contact to make sure it was okay. Um, and so I went and sat for a while. You know, I, I took uh, took some money with me as well. Uh, and his name. Um, I'm so glad that I did. His name is Travis. Uh, and while I was talking to him, I noticed that Damien, our 10 year old walked up and he wanted to sit and chat as well. So he was involved in, in this and Travis, um, you know, is a guy who at the time we were speaking, uh, he talked about, um, he told me his story. I didn't really ask too much about his story, but he decided to tell me his story that, um, that he was homeless because, uh, he'd come across bad times through drugs. Like he admitted that he'd had a drug problem. Um, before that, you know, he was a father with a, with a daughter, um, you know, clearly, you know, his marriage broke down and things like that. And the daughter is with the mother, uh, and he's allowed to have access to his daughter, but only if he cleans up. So he was on a journey that was still nine months from being over at the time of trying to, you know, to rehabilitate and clean up from drugs. Um, 
and he was doing that because he wanted to see his daughter again and and he was the nicest guy um you know he wasn't complaining and blaming the world and whatever else uh he just he was just telling me his story so um yeah so we'd had that chat with him you know i left saying god bless and you know wished him well and uh, left him with some money just to help him out with his with his daily needs and whatever um yeah and as i was walking away with damien i, I just put my arm around him and said look damien you've just met your first real superhero and i thought that there's an evangelizing moment right there because damien knows that well, hopefully he knows that most of what i do or the good stuff i do is motivated by the gospel um and so I think it's, you know, you. it took me a long time to build up the courage to speak to, you know, people on the streets. Like, uh, I, I, I could easily say I'm 37 years old now. It wasn't really until I was like 34, 35 before I actually found the courage to go and sit with someone. Uh, it's taken a long time. But, um, but I think it's good for, for kids to, um, to see that too. And then, you know, Damien spontaneously walked up. I didn't know he was going to do that, but. Um, there, I think there was a lot of blessing in him being able to do that. You got another one? Um, yeah, I think we've got one. Well, I've got a few sort sure. of points here and there. Yeah, um, yep. Just um, going over your one. So I remember something similar happening with my dad. It wasn't so detailed as going up to someone, but uh, I do remember when we were all in the city. I'm not quite sure where my mum was, but um, all four of us kids were there, and it was probably a bit of a harrying moment for my father. <laughs> yep. Um, probably trying to. I think he was trying to get some of us to eat food, and I was. Being the oldest and actually responsible was actually eating mine, and I think, of course, I think <laughs> at least one of my other siblings weren't eating theirs. So, in the end, I, I don't know if it was out of frustration or <laughs> um, uh, probably a bit of frustration and perhaps some compassion as well. He, instead of getting one of the kids to eat the banana that they clearly didn't want, he ended up handing it to a homeless person, yeah, um, who probably finished that banana and you can tell he needed it, like yeah, unkempt, uh, unshaven, and yeah, yeah, and 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 all you know. Probably I don't know when he might have last had a meal, um, and that's that. That memory has just stuck with me throughout life, and you know the, this was a long time ago, probably yeah. in excess of twenty twenty five years, mm. and that's yeah, you know, that's never left me, and that sort of came to me again as you were talking then. Um, and another experience I've had with that is actually rather than going to the city, I actually had an experience with the local one. Yep. Um, in that, uh, Caitlin and I were going shopping, um, just together, just her and I. Uh, probably for food or whatever else and yeah, we got out of the car as usual we're going to walk into the shops and I saw a lady there and didn't think much of it but then as I was getting um, I think as I was getting Kate and I realised she was crying so yeah. I, well, what am I going to do now because <laughs> I thought well what's the worst that could happen so I, I did the same thing I went up and just said what's wrong and uh, that's almost what she needed to hear was yep. um, was a bit of kind words she said she knew people but she'd been um, I think she'd just been thrown out um, of where she was living, right. um, obviously it seemed like an abusive relationship that yes, she was yeah. in. I don't believe there was any children involved, but um, you know, she could, you could see she was in a bad way. So you know, I did the same thing. I slipped her some money. I, I reasoned that even if she's making all this up, mm. this is the logic in me, even if she's making all this up, she's clearly in a worse position than I am. Yeah. Um, and it was really, it was really enough to for her to buy food. You know, if I had food, I'd prefer to give her food. Yeah. Um, but it was enough for her to buy food or a bus pass. And um, you know, she thanked me and, and gave Caitlin a cup <laughs> that yeah. she had. Oh, okay. <laughs> which I don't actually yeah. know what happened to that cup. But, oh. I mean, it was more, it was a, it was a token gesture. Yes, yes, Like, yeah. the cup would not have been worth the money that I gave, yeah. clearly. But it was something that she she wanted to do because she felt the gratitude, which I was then able to show Caitlin, who quite possibly, being young enough, she didn't remember. Yep. Um. Uh, you know, it's just one example of things that um, that I could have done then. Um, I'll just do one more quick one, and this sure. is more a one that I want to do rather than I'm currently doing, is um, getting my family involved in the choir. Mm. Now, we've got a we we're lucky we've got a choir that we sit near. Um, in terms of being able to get there, it's just not something we've been able to do. But yeah. it is something I can see, especially Caitlin being the older one, but I think James too because of the way he sings along. To music in the car, and we know he likes to be loud in mass, <laughs> <laughs> sitting down to the ground. Yeah, <laughs> that's something I'd more want to. I know it. I I believe it would help a lot. Um, being able to join in there, and the reason I say that is over the Easter period this year, uh, I was involved in singing. I was planning to sing two songs, and we only ended up needing to do one. Um, and I brought Kate along with me, and at that mass, it was the vigil mass for Easter. Um, I went and did my psalm, and Kate needed somewhere to sit and. 
she just dis- disappeared into the choir. We didn't know where oh, she went. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew she was with the choir, but I didn't know exactly where she disappeared to. And my wife Priscilla was like, "Where's Kaylin, guys? She's up the front with the rest of the choir. Like, why is she there? Why isn't Lovely. she with us? Yeah. <laughs> why, why, how has she got the the bravery and the audacity to sit, you know, away from us? Which is not something she usually does. She yeah. usually sits with us every week. Um, so it's something I'd like to be able to do. And if you've got the opportunity, I'd say go for it because mm. a choir is integral." to the running of the mass because they're yeah. always involved. There's um, there's so many parts where you know, and it is just singing, but they're always involved and it's it teaches them a you know a greater part of the mass is the music. That's and, and it yeah. incidentally it just teaches them the like to be familiar with the structure of the mass as well. Because you know that there's, there's so many parts and, yes. yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Um all right, well my last one is uh similar about involvement in mass. Um and actually no I'll I'll just do a small one first and then I'll do the involvement in mass one because I haven't mentioned my son, Alexander, who's, who's one turning two in February next year. Um, so with, uh, with, with children who are still trying to learn how to speak <laughs> and have limited vocabularies. Oh, and they're trying. <laughs> and they're trying. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah, he certainly says a lot, just not, of it, not a lot of it makes a lot of sense yet. Um, I think there are, you can um, give familiarity with faith to them as well. So two things that we have with him. One is um, we have a, um, a small crucifix in our lounge room and we point it out to him often. And we go, look, there's Jesus. If, if we say to him now, where's Jesus? He'll look in that direction, but he'll also get upset until we bring the cross down and let him kiss it too. Cause he knows like we've built in him kiss Jesus. And he knows like, for example, um, you know, I wear, I wear a cross. Um, uh, what is it? Um, what is it? Neck, necklace. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That, um, and uh, sometimes he'll see this piece of string around my neck and he'll pull it out and the cross pops out and he'll see it and he'll go, Mwah, you know, give it a kiss. So at least uh, we're teaching him, even if he doesn't comprehend who Jesus is yet, at least that the idea of the love for, for Jesus, which will mature and develop later on. The other thing is when we're praying, uh, we emphasize words, say them a bit, you know, like you would speak to a, a little child. And the big thing we do is like when we say amen, we go amen. Oh, they love that when they <laughs> yeah. get that out. Yeah, they love that. And he, he goes, and he thinks it's funny. He goes, ah, wow, something like that. But at least, again, he's, uh, we're involving him in prayer in some kind of way. He's not a quiet observer waiting for us to finish praying so he can eat. <laughs> he's at least involved in that. Um, but yeah, the other main one, just building on your uh, involvement in the choir. I think involvement in mass is good. This year, Damien just started altar serving, uh, and it's something that we've been encouraging him to do for a while, uh, and and now he's he's into it, which is really good to see. But I think um, if you can get your children altar serving, it, it's good because they are more in, in a way they're probably more involved in the mass than we are in a sense. But they're, um, uh, I said to Damien because he was a bit scared. I said, "Don't be scared. This is um this is service. You're actually serving." Um, Literally, <laughs> you're serving at the mass. You're actually helping. You're you are part of the mass. Uh, you know, being a successful liturgy because you're assisting our parish priest. Um, and I think it's good because there are other young children there who he serves with as well. Uh, and they've also built a pretty good bond as well. You know, when they see each other at mass, you know, like I was really, it was really nice to see when he walked in and go, "Oh, Damien, you came back. You're here. You know, like you're still serving. You know, <laughs> you didn't do one and run away, but it's like they do. Oh, it's good to see you." And I'm looking forward to Damien serving in some of the bigger liturgies. You know, we'll be getting into the um, into uh, Christmas in a few months tomorrow. You know, just <laughs> it's going to seem like sneak up on it. Yeah, um, but the, you know, there'll be all those liturgies for him to get involved in as well. And I think it's good for him to see it from you know, like being right up there where the action is. You know, I used to altar serve a long time ago as well, and I think it's it was a good thing for me. You know, in terms of again getting to know the structure of the mass. You had a stint as how well. They, how, they, how things have changed since then. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's very different now. But um, but it, it's it's good to to see that. And, and you know, he's right there involved in the liturgy. He, you know, you help with different parts. You help with the gifts. You help with holding candles, or you help with holding books, or whatever it might be. You know, you help with um, you know, with uh, was it thorable and yep. incense and everything? Helping at communion where you can get punched on the shoulder by your uncle. That's right. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah, <laughs> or uh, or having uh, your younger brother, you know, shouting you know, <laughs> when he sees you. Yeah, there's all those um, all those things. But I think that involvement's good. The other thing as well is um, because I had enough voice to be able to do it. Uh, when um, Damien had his first communion, it was my uncle Alex, the one who we named our son Alexander after. He happened to be in Australia from Peru. You know, it was once in a every five years kind of break. 
Um, and uh, we knew that Damien was just about ready to do his Holy Communion anyway. So we spoke to Uncle Alex and also with our parish priest, the old previous Father Michael, and said, would it be all right for um, you know, my uncle to do, uh, to do Damien's First Communion? And Father Michael was happy with that. And he was also just about to go on his October um, holiday anyway. So my uncle had agreed to, uh, to take over and do the Sunday Masses because priests say Mass every day anyway, even if they're on their own. So that was perfect for him. Um, so I did the final bit of Damien's preparation um, for, for it. And uh, I got Damien involved by getting him to read his first communion. So he just did the psalm, I think it was. Um, but I thought it would be a good way to get him involved um, in the mass that was, you know, in which he was part of, in which he was going to receive God in a very, um, in a very special way for the first time in his life. Um, and then also when Alexander had his baptism, which we had during mass, um, I asked for permission for Damien to read and he did the first reading. So um, it's just a, it, I, I think it's great for him to be, if you can do it, it depends on our parishes are all different, but if you can get your kids involved at a young age, if they're ready, um, I think it's a, like, cause Damien was nine years old for Alexander's baptism and eight years old, I think for his communion. So whatever it was anyway, but because we knew he was ready, we didn't force him or push him or anything. He, you know, he was a bit nervous, but because we had that opportunity, we said, you know, we asked him to, to take it. So he got to proclaim God's word at mass. And, um, and I thought that was a, just a beautiful connection that he could have to his faith too. Oh, very yeah. good, very good. Um, yes, yeah, I mean that's another reason for me to sort of get try and get into the choir because at our parish, yeah. uh, Caitlin's not going to be able to do the altar serving unless things change. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Every every parish is different, yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, beautiful. But yeah, any involvement, um, I, I think is is really good. Like, and then like I said, when you have that involvement, see what you can do to bring the mass into your into your home as well. So uh, I'm sure there are many more. Uh, but we'll we'll stick with that for now. Are there any others that you wanted to add quickly? Any, any nothing quick major. Tips? Um, grace before meals. That's absolutely that's become. Um, I should surprise you somehow managed to clip, to clip over that. But yep. um, yeah, my kids are really good at it. I think I remember once at our again going back to our wives' house. Yes. I feel like, and again going back to James, I feel like once when they're about to eat, I feel like he said, "We haven't said grace because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think they're." Some sort of Christian, they don't mind what we do, yes. but they don't do grace before meals, yes. certainly. And so, yeah. of course, James with his loud outburst. Yeah. Um, I don't know actually what happened after that. I think we ended up saying it yeah. with grins on our faces. But, yeah. Um, no, it's good, though. It's a, it's, I mean, now the kids are evangelizing <laughs> other families, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, schooling's probably another one. We've both yes. taken, chosen to take our kids to the local Catholic school, which, um, to whatever degree it might do, it will reinforce what we teach them at home and at church. Yep. Um, uh, I think that's probably the main ones I'd sort of scribble down, um, just to sort of make sure we didn't uh, didn't completely skip over. Yep. All right. Very good. So, uh, if um, you who are listening have any uh, tips for things that you do that help to evangelize your kids, um, then we'd love to hear it. Uh, so uh, let's move on to. I'm just looking at the time. We've had a, this is a long topic. Let's. Uh, we've got another topic to discuss. So let's move on to faith beyond borders. I'm actually feeling rather good about this. I think we've all arrived at a very special place, eh? Oh. Spiritually, ecumenically. How do you make somebody love you without affecting free will? Welcome to my world, son. You come up with an answer to that one, you let me know. Yes, I had to work very hard to pass Latin and theology. Oh, quite. Those are, of course, the most important things. Oh, eh? yeah. This one out, Cap. I don't see how I can. These guys come from legend. They're basically gods. There's only one god, man. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. So, Jerry, this Faith Beyond Borders, again, uh, comes from a different place. We Normally, Faith Beyond Borders is about uh, people of faith who have gone out and done something in the, in the world. So, um, gone to the peripheries, like Pope Francis uh, says. But this one is more about what happens when the peripheries uh, come back to you and they're not, and maybe they're a little bit less kind. Um, so I'll give some context. Uh, we have spoken quite a little bit about the seal of confession and mandatory reporting in Victoria. So very quickly, in Victoria, it is now law for a priest to report if they hear in confession uh, something related to child abuse. They have to report it to police. If they don't, then they, go, then they can go to prison for up to three years. Our archbishop in this city and also many priests have said, we're not doing that. 
we're not going to break the seal of confession. So um, in response to um, the Archbishop um, Peter Comensoli and others saying we're not going to do that, um, a councillor from the Melbourne City Council um, has come up with uh, what he thinks is a bylaw that should address this problem. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a worrying uh, proposal that he's made. So his proposal is that all priests and, uh, and the Archbishop um, who are in the Shire of Melbourne, um, should be asked directly if they will support mandatory reporting, you know, breaking the seal of confession um, if they hear about child abuse. If their answer is no, then by law, a sign should be placed outside the front of the church or St. Patrick's Cathedral that says this place may not be safe for your children. So that's the, uh, that's the motion that's been put. I actually went onto the Melbourne City Council website and read it. It's pretty similar. Um, and the, the person who proposed it uh, was an Anglican minister, was, I think. Yes. Yep. Um, and what was his name? Uh, Nick Francis Gilly is his name. He's a councillor for the, the Shire of Melbourne. Um, and, uh, and he was also, we should point out, he was um, a victim of child abuse. So, you know, clearly um, we don't want to make light of that either. And it, so it makes sense to me why he wants to see this, you know, this proposal and why he's made this proposal because he's got um, that history there as well. Um, however, we've probably got some issues with this motion. So, Jared, what do you think about a motion to put a sign outside St. Pat's Cathedral, which we've been to many times, or a Catholic church that says this place may not be safe for children if priests don't break the seal of confession? Right. Well, we've talked, uh, as you said, we've talked in the previous episodes how breaking the seal of confession or forcing or trying to force priests to break the seal of confession just practically isn't a good idea. You know, yep. We've mentioned that you know, it, would, it would mean that people just wouldn't confess at all where they otherwise might. It might mean the difference between identifying a sexual predator and not because they might decide they, need, they want a confession, they want to own up and, and, and face the life, let's say, yeah. and the first place they might want to go is to a priest. But if they're now thinking that, all of a sudden, it's all going to come to light because it's not what they say isn't going to be, um, you know, between them and God anymore. Then maybe they won't go through with it, and therefore they'll still remain where they are, unidentified. The whole setup of this does seem quite targeted. Now we mm. did talk about it in again talking about it in a previous episode how yes. it was seen to be uh, targeted at priests and not lawyers and journalists, for example, in terms of giving up sources or revealing information. And yep. now this is again another step further, which Really, it's um, it's almost like they're saying, well, we're going to in, enact a punishment for something you haven't yet committed. You just say you're going to do it, um, which is that seems a stretch even by any imagination. That if you haven't, it's it's almost a bit um, what minority report? Yeah, yeah, yeah in a way, yeah. That um, you haven't committed the crime, but we you think and we think you're going to commit the crime because of what you said. So we're going to punish you for it. Yeah, and that seems that's. Uh, that need you know no one needs me to say that sounds a really worrying um, sign of things not just as a Catholic but as a person that people want to make um, go author this far authoritarian yeah because we're talking about a bylaw here so it's a you know a local a local law councils can can do uh, local laws many of which we complain about usually around some you no know, rates and our our garbage bin collections or whatever but this is a lot more serious I was having a discussion with a colleague because this was on uh, it was Friday. So basically, uh, it was um, the last day of the working week of, of term in, the, in an afternoon. It just happened to pop up on my screen at midday. So this is going to be voted on. Uh, so it's next week on Tuesday for us, but when this podcast comes out, the voting would have already happened. Now, my sneaking suspicion is it probably isn't going to pass. It's just, you know, but it did get some media attention. Great. Okay, there's a story for a Friday afternoon. Um, I would be surprised if it did pass and shocked and disappointed, but... Uh, I don't. I, I, I don't really see what it what it gained. What anything yeah. gain, anything is gained by doing this. Yeah. In all honesty, but anyway. Yeah. Carry but on. My my discussion is this, right? So, where else in society do we tell people, "Will you follow the law, or we're going to shame you?" So, Jared, if you, uh, if I ask you, um, will you promise to follow the law to not murder someone, 
Well, let's go. Let's make a list. Let, let me dial it back Because I'd probably say, yes, yeah. I think I will follow the yeah. law. But all right. What about, you know, theft? No, okay. actually, yeah. hey, do, do it with my profession. Do you promise not to tax dodge? Okay, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Because yeah. quite a few otherwise law-abiding citizens probably would put a few, you know. Yeah. Uh, all right. Less okay. than kosher. And I'm not saying people yeah. that I know. I, it seems to be that people get audited and they get and they get found out. Yeah. But otherwise, you know, that they would have nothing uh, otherwise staining them. So let's just go with that. I like your example. So would you go up to an average Australian and say, will you promise when you fill out your tax return to make sure it's to, you know, to the best of your knowledge, um, accurate, fair, and that you aren't just throwing a couple of extra receipts to get a bit, bit of extra cash with your refund? Uh, and a person might say, or they might say, yeah, of course, you know, whatever. But another person might say, well, I, I refuse to answer that question. So do we put a sign out the front of their they house might, saying- They might take the fifth. Yeah, that's right. Fifth Amendment. Yeah, yeah, but um, but you know, yeah, even though it's a different country, but yeah, what have we got in our constitution? Is there? Yeah, but um, but you know, would you put a sign on their front lawn saying this person may not be able to be trusted with their taxes, you know, or with your money, you know? Don't what um, like where do we ever compel someone to set, to commit to following the law, um, in that kind of way? Um, so why would we now need a law to make sure that priests follow the law? It doesn't make any sense. And then the idea is that you would now go and name and shame someone um, with a sign um, and, and with a very inflammatory sign that says this may not be safe for children. I mean, that's, that's kind of inflammatory and insulting in a way. So I'm thinking, for example, let's, you know, let's use a bad example like an, or an extreme-ish one. Our parish has a not very good history. Right? In fact, it has a terrible history. And you could Google Holy Family Dufton and you'll find all the news reports. I don't need to go into its history right now. Um, but my parish is safe for children. I bring my children. So does every, we have a lot of children at our masses because, um, since all those, you know, decades ago, things have happened. The Catholic church in Melbourne and Australia has upped its game a lot. There are, there are so many, so many procedures and mandated things that parishes have to do to comply with parish, uh, with, with, um, with archdiocese, archdiocesan rules to make sure their child's safe. Um, to the point where some priests get irritated because there's a lot they have to do. And in fact, a lot, um, a lot of parishes have other people that work in the parish to make sure that child safety things are implemented. Well, we have that as a role, I believe. We have a role a in our parish. Role yeah. for, um, I can't yep. remember the name of it, but it is basically, well, their role is yeah. She's all safety. about child safety. Yeah. That's her job. Yeah. In fact, she bothers me every year to make sure <laughs> I give her a copy of my VIT card to say that I've updated, you know, that I'm still compliant. Um, but but what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that um, you know, how does a person who is, I use the word outside very, very carefully, but a person who's, who's outside of the everyday Catholic experience, um, you know, why would they be able to create a law that puts a sign in front of your church that says your church might be unsafe for children when you've been bringing your children there for a long time? I, th- I think this is kind of grandstanding and it's based on what I've labeled as a feel good law. And I don't, I don't step back from that. This is a feel-good law where politicians are about to stand up and say, this is about the protection of children. Um, you know, why wouldn't you do this? If you oppose this law, you oppose the protection of children. Um, so I, I, think there's, I think this is just a, a bizarre bit of grandstanding. And I do acknowledge that he's a victim of child abuse himself. But if you, you know, this is really not the way to go about it. Uh, if you really want priests to do something differently, you should maybe dialogue with them. Maybe actually speak to priests and find out why they refuse to comply or why they say they'll go to jail. Well, we've also covered that as well. Uh, and we have, and there are many reasons. But a yeah. lot of the sound bites are, I'm not going to comply with this law. Yes. It doesn't go on to say what they're going to do as well as or instead of, hmm. in that they would do everything in their power to make sure that what they exactly. said in the confessional was repeated outside. And that's been said publicly and doesn't appear in this very <laughs> article they have right in front of me, which we'll put in our show notes. This article instead talks about, yeah, um, Archbishop um, Comensoli saying, yes, I will go to prison rather than do this, yeah, but not the other things that he said about it as well. Yeah, so uh, is there anything else you wanted to say about this one? A couple one? of things. Um, first of all, what I'd like to see, and I'm betting it won't happen, is comparison of, say, um, you know, St. Pat's Cathedral, even our local parish, a comparison of their child protection details and compare that to Melbourne City Councils and see which <laughs> yeah. is actually more safer to children. Yeah. Because, like you said, the amount of onerous, and in a good way, yeah. or for a good reason, I should say, the amount of onerous things that have to be done now, um, it's it's staggering. But it, yeah. it, it is all for the protection of children. Yeah. 
Um, we could have a sign that says, this city council, uh, be, you know, be warned, it may not be safe for your children to enter. <laughs> um, and then secondly, so um, there's something I'd written down here for it, was that a light has been shone on this issue. It's an uncomfortable and a harsh light, mm. and it's been difficult and uncomfortable for us to bear. But it's also made it much, much harder for monsters, the horrible people, to commit such awful deeds among, upon the most innocent amongst us. The ideal amount of sex abuse cases that should even occur, let alone get reported, should be zero. Yeah. So I believe confessional reporting won't affect this. What will affect it is formation, guidance, responsibility, and oversight. And these measures are already in place in churches. And who said that? Me. You. Oh, well, good words. <laughs> I thought you were reading everything. Does it, does it yes. have to be someone? <laughs> no, it, sound, it sounds like someone from the church because that's ex- everything you said there is exactly true. So, um, the Archdiocese of Melbourne was asked about this it's particular... It's not copyrighted, that line. You can take whatever you want from it. No, that's great. Well, copyrighted now. That's, that's good, yeah, before the Archdiocese steals it from you. Um, oh, they can have it. Yeah. Please. <laughs> yeah. <If> it helps. <laughs> um, so, uh, Francis Moore, who works at the Archdiocese, he's the Executive Director of Administration there. Uh, he was approached about this motion, and he said, the Archdiocese is, is committed to the safety of all children and has been on public record since 2013 in favour of the extension of mandatory reporting to include clergy. He obviously means without confession, but he means everything else. Other than noting that the proposed motion may be discussed at a committee meeting and not by the full council, we have no further comment. And that probably, I reckon that works. <laughs> That'll do there. Yep, they should add your little quote there as well, Jerry. That was, that was really well said. Um, anything else? That was my piece. My, cool. pick, my four bits. That was your four bits, yeah. <laughs> A uh, bit of Looney Tunes there. <laughs> all right, so that's no, all right. You can't help it. Um, we love it. All right, so we'll uh, finish this episode with a bit of follow-up. So, Jerry, I know you're kicking yourself because you wanted to be part of our previous episode, episode 18, where Caroline and I talked about whether or not a robot could be a substitute for a human Catholic priest. So what was your answer? Uh, essentially, uh, in a nutshell, it was no. <laughs> and what was our what was our feedbacks? I answer? love this. I want to mention this. So I was just flicking through um SQPN's feedback. We do encourage feedback on the SQPN website or Facebook page, I should say. Uh, and James H. I won't read surname, but James H. You can look this up. Uh, so basically, the uh the tagline for the to advertise the podcast said, "Could a robot ever be a suitable substitute for a human priest?" James succinctly said, "Nope," <laughs> and I love it. That's great feedback. It is very true. I did say thank you because I said, James, that sums up our thoughts in a word, to which he said, good to inform everyone, though, in case there, were, there was any doubt. And I think that's the, importance of, the important reason of having a, 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 more, um, a longer discussion about it, to talk about the theology of it, which we did, and even to talk about some of the theology from, I forgot her name now, I think it was Sister Leah, who's, a, I think, a Franciscan nun who uh, had a different point of view about why robots would be good priests, to which we carefully and politely disagreed. Now, I'm spewing because, yeah, you said you discussed the theological points, but you didn't discuss the practical points. No, so what were the, yeah, give some follow-up on some of the practical issues, Jerry. So what happens when your robot priest decides, you know, not to work, to malfunction for that? Do you tap its um, cranium to, you know, like you would a, yeah. what, like you would a PC? Like to hit a machine, get working again, <laughs> damn it, yeah. <laughs> and um, what if it's, what if you just, your frustration boils over for whatever reason, like it would at a machine that doesn't work, what, do you start swearing at your priest now? <laughs> you swear at your robot priest, yeah. I don't no, know. It's going to go down well. Yeah, I couldn't treat a robot the same way I treat a person. In fact, I do. I treat my machines much differently to what I treat a person. Yeah. Um, things I might say to a machine, I would be horrified if I ever said to a person, but a, if we have in Robata Christi, then I don't know, that leaves me in a bit, practically, it leaves me in a bit of a quandary because you're not working for whatever reason. I want to growl at you, but you're also a priest in, <laughs> in inverted commas, definitely. Um, I shouldn't be saying these things to a priest. And I would, I would have to go to confession if I treated my robot pit priest the way I do the photocopier at work. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, you know, we were talking about a practical level is, you know, uh, so Apple just released um, oh, yes. Mac OS Catalina, <laughs> which is their latest uh, operating system, and there's been a few glitches. So, uh, what would happen if you updated your priest? You know, did its you know regular updates, and then there was a major glitch. Like I this operation cannot be formed and will shut down. Yeah, um, suddenly the priest can't perform Eucharist because the that you know app is too old for the current operating system. I don't know. I know we're being ridiculous. Yes, but... if we get a Microsoft uh, priest and you get his blue. Blue eyes of death. Blue eyes of death. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, just text in the where the eyes should be. Yeah, scrolling across the screen. Yeah. What if your priest um 
shuts down in the middle of mass so it can do updates, you know, restarts for updates. <laughs> oh, like it does without telling you. Yeah, you? like it does without telling you. Like, um, yeah, like Windows has, happens to do sometimes. All right, we're being a bit silly, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are a lot of concerns with that. But if you have further feedback, anyone who's listening on Robot Priests, we'd, we'd love to hear that too. Uh, I should also point out that... Um, uh, one of the uh, one of my leaders at school, who I immediately work for, also chimed in a comment and he said, "Can I get a robot REC? The REC at my school is a religious education coordinator, of which I, of one I which I happen to be myself. So um, I'm getting the feeling I don't need to turn into where I have to work on Monday because there might be a robot replacement there." All right. Uh, so um, we just wanted to say thank you very much for listening to episode 19 of the Catholics of Oz. And before we go today, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the Catholics of Oz and all of the other shows on StarQuest. Today, we want to thank Tristram C, Doreen M, Randy S, Mandy L, and Andrew P. Through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for the Catholics of Oz and all of the other shows at StarQuest to continue. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Also, we'd love to know your thoughts about the topics that we've discussed today. You can send us feedback by visiting sqpn.com slash oz, spelt O-Z, where you can also find our show notes. You can also visit us at uh, StarQuest Facebook page, facebook.com slash StarQuest Media, and you can like us and leave some feedback there. But also, we have our own Facebook page for Catholics of Oz, which is at facebook.com slash Catholics of Oz. So you can join us there and discuss our latest episode. You can also reach us by email at catholicsofoz at sqpn.com. Jerry, thank you so much for being on the show today. Pleasure to have been here. And once again, I'm Lindsay Sand. Thanks for listening to The Catholics of Oz on StarQuest. Star Quest.